Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. Greetings, Produce Buzzers podcast fans, and welcome to another episode of the podcast for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. I'm your host, Edwin Stepp, executive editor of ProduceBuzz.com. I am joined once again by Teresa Nolan, the president and founder of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, both contributing editors to Produce Buzz. This week's episode is the second one that we recorded at the Southeast Produce Council's annual trade show in Orlando, Florida. Since we were in a convention hall, there is a little more background noise than usual. So apologies for that, and we hope you won't find it too distracting. But you will be able to hear all of the produce buzzers and our special guests without any difficulty. Today, you will hear the inspiring story about one of the most recognized brands in the fruit and veggie business. The family-owned company was built over the past 60 years by three generations of women who, despite the odds, rose to prominence in the male-dominated produce industry. So stay tuned to meet this week's guest and learn about how these women brought some of your favorite fruits and veggies to your table. If you are a regular listener to the Produce Buzzers podcast, you know that we, Produce Buzzers, have fresh produce in our blood. And that is why we are so excited about today's episode. Our guest today also has fresh produce in her blood and maybe an extra dose than we do. I'm quite sure that a lot of our listeners know the fresh produce brand Frida's Specialty Produce. Our guest today is the granddaughter of the founder of Frida's Specialty Produce. Her name was, surprisingly, Frida. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Frida Rappaport Kaplan. Frida Kaplan was a pioneer in the fresh produce industry and was responsible for bringing some fruits and veggies to your table that were virtually unknown in the U.S. before she had the vision and the savvy to import them. Her story is a fascinating one. You're going to want to stick around to hear it. But first, let's introduce her granddaughter and hear her story. She, like her grandmother, is blazing new trails in the produce industry as the director of sales for Frida's Specialty Produce. Welcome to the show today, Alex Jackson. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Great. Thank you for joining us. Alex is the eldest daughter of Frida's daughter, Karen Kaplan, and Karen is the CEO of Frida's Specialty Produce now. So Alex is a third generation executive of the company. You can see why we said she has an extra dose of produce in her blood. She likes to point out that she attended her first produce trade show at the age of two in a stroller. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if she closed a few deals at that point. (laughs) You must have been a cute little baby there, and I'm sure that helped them close some deals. (laughs) But Alex joined the company officially in 2011 after graduating from George Mason University, and she started out in the marketing department. She moved into sales in 2014 as an account manager. In 2014, Alex was accepted into the United Fresh Leadership Program Class 20, along with 11 other produce industry leaders. United Fresh was a major industry trade group at the time. At 24, she was the youngest professional to be accepted into that program. In 2017, Alex was named one of the 40 under 40, 40 years old, by Produce Business Magazine for her success and leadership in the produce industry. Alex served as a member of the Produce Marketing Association's Women's Fresh Perspective Advisory Committee and was co-chair from 2015 to 2017. Now, it's March, 
and March is Women's History Month. So we are especially honored to have Alex as a guest to hear about her grandmother's story. But first, we want to hear more about Alex's story. Tell us about your experience, what you love about the produce industry, and maybe some of the most valuable lessons you've learned, or some of the some interesting stories. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks again for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So I had graduated college in 2011, but before that, I grew up in the industry, obviously. So every winter break, summer break, spring break, I worked at Frida's from filing to trade shows. I remember my first PMA Fresh Summit in Orlando where I sampled pomelos and I was like studying the fact sheet we had about it on the plane there and then I got to go to Disney World after so that was my reward um, and now we're here back in Orlando at That's SCPC right. and That's it's right. just full circle so worked all through middle school and high school and college internships and then my mom was kind of like look like you need to go get more experience outside of Frida's and so she reached out to her network to see if anyone had any internship opportunities I could apply for because this was before LinkedIn and before right. it was super easy to find access on you know opportunities especially for young talent and Danelle Mackey Almy from DMA Solutions was like she can come work for me oh, yeah. for a summer so it's an, it's an advertising agency yeah they do produce marketing them, right. and so I moved to Dallas for a summer I lived with Steve Grinstead from Fresh Edge for a <laughs> summer and then worked for Danelle so the produce family was in full force when I was in Dallas and that's when I attended my first produce trade show without my mom and that's when I realized I loved the produce industry it was nice to see that you know I had a different perspective I realized it's a really big family industry it everyone's pretty friendly and we're doing good you know we're helping to increase consumption it's all about selling something that's good for people and it's hard to come by being able to market or sell product that's actually really good for people that's so true, yeah. um so i knew i loved produce but i still wasn't convinced i wanted to work at frida's because you know it's my family's business is that expected of me like i don't have that burning sensation to go work there yet so then the next summer, I worked at a family produce business in Australia, in Sydney, Perfection Fresh, Australia, with the Simonettas. And I saw three brothers working together and, you know, their nieces and nephews and kids coming in. And I realized being a part of a family business is really special. And that was the summer before my senior year. And I went to that year's PMA. It was my 21st birthday. It was in Orlando. And I went to PMA Fresh Summit that October uh, 2010. And that kind of solidified, working that trade show solidified for me that I wanted to work at Frida's. And, you know, we don't create positions for family members, so I had to apply, and they happened to have an opening in marketing for communications, and what that's what that, I studied. What was that interview like? It must have been You tough. know, I think, I think <laughs> yeah, tell I me a time you. that you. <laughs> exactly. So I think that trade show was kind of more my interview than anything, yeah. you know, watching me at Fresh Summit. Could I hold my own? Could I speak about the products? Could I, you know, be professional and not act like I'm just Karen's daughter? And right. so, um, so I did all that and they were super excited that I wanted to come work there. So that's my journey into produce. And I started in marketing. I was in marketing for three and a half years and worked my way through that department. And literally one day my mom said, um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to put you into sales. I have someone leaving and I don't have anyone like ready to go and I, I can't let this position be empty. And I think you'd be great. And sales is hard in produce. It's perishable. <laughs> like it is not, you know, it is sitting there waiting to go. Right. right. And it's risky and it's hard, but now I know it's very rewarding. And, but I didn't at the time and I didn't appreciate my mom recognizing that I may have this strength in sales. And literally she threw me into sales on a Monday and I was very upset. <laughs> uh, she, I, and I found out I got the job because she emailed our IT department saying, please add Alex to the account manager email group. And I was like, well, I guess I'm an account manager now. So that's great. And she was right. I love sales. I was a natural. It's hard, but it's very rewarding. I mean, to, of course, make a sale for the company is really nice. And then also, you know, you're bringing fresh produce to consumers around the country and maybe even around the globe. And now with all the different channels, just knowing that you make a difference. And so 
I've been in sales for almost six years, um, worked my, or no, almost eight years, worked my way up through there. And I've been the director of sales for three years now. So um, manage a team of 10 people. I have a couple of my team members here at this trade show today. And I love it. I love it. That's I'm really that's, grateful. That's fantastic. And I, you know, I think, you know, your grandmother and your mother are both pioneers in the business and mm-hmm. smart, smart business people. And, you know, I'm sure they wanted you to come and work, but I, that to, if I'm understanding your story right, they were not going to let you have an easy road in and for a d- good reason. Exactly. And they didn't pressure me. Yeah. Of course, my grandma was my biggest fan and she <laughs> was, you know, she knew I could do anything and she, I knew, wanted to see me join the business, but she also wanted me to be happy. And so she never, I never felt pressure, right. but I knew that they'd be happy. So like, that's also nice to know. Um, and then they didn't, you know... I, I was treated like everyone else. I had reviews, performance reviews the same way. And, yep. you know, if I like maybe slipped up in a meeting and like rolled my eyes at my mom, like my aunt Jackie, who runs the business with my mom, yeah. she was like kind of my unofficial mentor where she'd be like, look, like I know your mom can frustrate you. Like, believe me, I'm her <laughs> sister, but like you can't roll your eyes in a meeting and yeah. you shouldn't wear that to a client meeting. And yeah. yeah, you know, so she would really guide me and, um, and you know they made i worked hard i really 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 worked hard so yeah. you're wearing a t-shirt that says formal is boring yes. so when they make you dress up for those meetings it sounds like you're not too happy about that yeah well and i like the t-shirt thank you yeah we like to have all these fun sayings on our t-shirts yeah. cuz Normal is boring. That's why we sell this. Oh, it's special. normal. Yeah, I normal. It said oh, no, no, no. Normal. <laughs> normal. Well, that's good too. Yeah. That's yeah. Good too. Normal is boring. And I try, when I travel for work, I try and wear like a Frida's t shirt because they're yeah. pretty witty. And uh, people love the normal is boring. Right. So we have one that said veggies for dessert for the SEPC trade show a few years ago. Uh, and everyone at the airport was like, veggies for dessert? I don't know about that. I was okay. like, you should give it a try. Yeah. So. All right. So Rick's you, got a question what, for you yeah. about the veggies for dessert. You were asking oh, yeah. Did you notice in the uh, seminar yesterday about 33% of people say they eat vegetables for dessert? Yes, I did notice that. Did, did you just mention that? I must have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So can you give me an example of a vegetable someone would eat for yeah, dessert? Yeah. So for us, what we really talk about is purple sweet potatoes. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have this delicious purple sweet potato pie. So our Stokes oh. purple sweet potatoes are this amazing variety right. that... Um, consumers have really grown to love and the texture of it is perfect for every preparation and one of them is for sweet potato pie and it's not too sweet so you can really tone it down you know bring it up whatever you'd like and so because, sweet potato. because those potatoes are already so sweet mm-hmm. you don't you maybe you do add maybe the recipe A calls little for bit. sugar but yeah, yeah not too much though right. and right. it's I think it's vegan because we just do coconut milk and um, and so it's delicious. So that's one way. You I can just s- picked up my first uh, purple sweet potato oh, uh, awesome. the other day. And um, is Stokes the variety? Yes, yeah, Stokes is the variety. So it was uh, created or started, it was grown originally in Stokes County, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And it's because of the soil and the water and you know the atmosphere there is um, ideal for this variety. And there's a lot of sweet potatoes grown in North Carolina, a lot of purple sweet potatoes grown in North Carolina. But this family wanted to stop growing. So they were like, well, the Stokes variety is really special. People love it. So where else can it be grown? And they found a grower in uh, Central California in Livingston. And so that's where, you know, similar weather to Stokes County, North Carolina. So they're now only grown in California. It's a proprietary seed variety. And we call it the Stokes Purple. Is Look. that, um, but it is seasonal, right? It's coming, uh, it's coming available. to an end? It's April. I mean, it's like any other sweet potato. It's harvested once a year. So they're harvested in August and cured. And then we start shipping them in September. And then we sell them till we run out, which is typically around May to June. Um, and then you have some off sizes in the summer. Yeah. But when I was preparing it, because I just didn't have a lot, I had zero experience with it. I, um, because it was so dense, if you will. And um, I boiled it a little bit, parboiled it, and then I threw it in the oven to roast it. Mm-hmm. Um, am I destroying every nutrient and vitamin that was in there? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, they're like you said, they're a really dense potato, and so boiling it, you're not going to... I mean, it's so packed with antioxidants. That's what gives it 
give it gives it its natural purple color you're not going to eliminate any of the nutrients and you know like most potatoes and sweet potatoes and a lot of produce a lot of nutrients are also in the skin but the skin's pretty hard to eat so well i love like a you know baked potato mm-hmm. and eating that skin yep. so good mm-hmm. butter Same. and salt and pepper <laughs> lathered all over it but sweet potatoes mm, no. not so much and even mashed potatoes you keep the skin on so this time i did not eat the uh, skin That's is that going to be similar to um, sweet potato? Yeah, it's just it's a little rough. It's not very palatable, and so by boiling it, you're not eliminating any of the nutrients in a way where you should be like, oh well, what's the point? Yeah, um, you know how they got the purple color? Natural uh, anti- antioxidant. So it's the antioxidant anthocyanin. So it wasn't crossbred in any way. No, nope. they just found it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this it's, was the one. Excuse me. That the the cardiologist said was one of the five blue places in the world and he said it was okinawa and he said that the okinawans eat it Mm -hmm. daily so there's five i think or six areas in the world that's labeled a blue zone and it's because their diet that they eat you know really promotes longevity and you know really healthy lifestyle and one of the items one of the places is okinawa japan and also loma linda california where there's a large japanese population and okinawan sweet potatoes are part of that diet and so he had said purple sweet potatoes are a great part of the blue zones diet and we were like yes and you can get those all around the country so um and other things like fish and olive oil and you know i think almonds or some type of nut and stuff like that so yeah yeah, now if i could ask you um about my heritage so did in those blue zones that they eat the purple uh sweet potato do they also have rice a lot? Because that's a mainstay in, a, in an Asian's I'm, diet. But I'm not sure. I don't think so, only because another area, another blue zone is somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, I want to say it's in Greece. Yes, you're right. And mm-hmm. they don't eat a lot of rice. Um, so I'm not sure about the rice. Now, I expected Rick to jump in and say, Cynthia, instead of boiling that potato, <laughs> if you had microwaved it first and then put it in the oven, he irradiates <laughs> everything. <laughs> we have a little running joke here because every time we talk about a specific vegetable, Rick goes, now, you know what I do with that is I put it in the microwave. Yeah, in my little little water. St- <laughs> so well, the you know, on the sweet potato, it, it works. I have a special baked potato maker for the microwave you've mm-hmm. probably seen those it has little spikes in the bottom and you take the potato and you push the spikes in it to put the holes in there and you can do a sweet potato the same way and it only takes about oh maybe three or four minutes on high and you've got a meal i mean it's That's awesome. it's a very simple way and it also retains a lot of the flavor mm-hmm. yeah. well i i would willing to get bet and this is clearly a guess but Putting the Japanese sweet potato on your bed of nails, mm-hmm. you know, the Japanese are so stubborn, it's going to take more than three or four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to put the Stokes purple but the sweet potato. You can well, microwave all you, them, Rick. That's you all can you're going to get in the United Stokes. States, yeah. it seems like. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we'll, like, you know, sample at client meetings. And sure. before it was like, you can't microwave the Stokes, it's too dense. And then we had someone oh, really? who worked for us who's like, I found a way to microwave it. You have to wrap it in a wet paper towel. I was like, genius. So mm. you can microwave it. And okay. I think it takes closer to like 10 minutes, but. Well, you know, right. this special cooker that I have may do the trick also because you should it try it out and let me yeah. know yeah i will perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> well even with so the now we can be a test kitchen for freedom <laughs> exactly <laughs> now i just have to find a purple sweet potato in duluth minnesota where i live well pick I'll one up at Publix one. uh in florida before you leave will do <laughs> or i think you know someone now who could make sure you can get some sweet potatoes in duluth <laughs> minnesota <laughs> you have the hook up now right that's what i was getting <laughs> got a supplier <laughs> Well, let's get back to your story. What are some of the most surprising things that you've learned since you started your career? Wow. I mean, about the produce industry, about myself. Whatever you want to go. I mean, so, you know, let me just ask you this. Yeah. You know, when your grandmother started, Mm -hmm. she was one of maybe the only woman. The only. The only woman for many years. Mm Mm-hmm. Is it getting easier for women in the produce industry, or you know, is it still a difficult? I like that question because it's all relative, of course, but even compared to when I started 10 years ago, I'd say it's easier, but it's, you know, the journey's definitely like 
we're not on the other side of it. You know, I was speaking to a young woman I've met in this industry who's, she's 24 and I was talking to her last night and she's like, I feel like my coworkers just see me as this little kid and, you know, my clients, like they love working with me and then they meet me in person and they're like, oh, like you're this young? Like, you know, and it, <laughs> and it changes their respect or it, the way they come off, it seems as if they maybe respect you differently. And so I think there's still this, you know, there's still a little bit of like the good old boys club where right. like the men love being with the men. And, um, and so us women love being with each other too. You know, <laughs> we have the women's conference and in my leadership class of, of 12, seven of us were women and we're still good friends. We get together every trade show. We go on trips every year together. So, you know, I think it is easier in the sense of, you have more women around you to lean on. Is it so much easier to do business and get automatic respect from clients or other vendors in the community or in the industry? I'm not sure that it's easier. No. Um, Still but, very much male dominated, yes. or you know, pop. You know, when yeah. you look around this trade show, <laughs> I I think that your grandmother cleared the road, your mom trailblazed, and also Teresa. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Well, what I was going to say is there's no such thing as easy in this business. So don't ever look at something. Is it easier? Because <laughs> it's not easy. Is it more tolerable? <laughs> <for women? Yeah. laughs> well, you know, I had a great experience mm -hmm. with the industry. And, you know, I was maybe it was because there were so few of us mm -hmm. that we were treated with great respect. Mm -hmm. So I felt very blessed to be able to be a part of the industry. Mm -hmm. So. And look at it now. And I think there's. Ha I think probably fifty percent of the people here are women. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And but it's funny because remember when that grower was uh, had cornered me and he said, um, you know, I saw Teresa at that meeting. He goes, boy, you know, you got to be careful with her because she comes off as this little southern belle. He goes, but that woman is sharp. <laughs> <laughs> we have awesome. to. We have to earn our way. It doesn't yeah. matter. And. And the guys have to earn their way, too. And I think if you face it, just say, I'm going to do the very best I can. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's where they, it brings the respect. And so, yeah, and I yeah. think, you know, I heard stories last night as well of, you know, a big client who's at this trade show. And there's still inequity in pay between men and women. Even someone, I know a woman who's a director, and she has someone who works for her who's a man and makes starting out as much as she does and she's worked her way up through this company now, is that because he's in sales and he can change no. the amount of his pay no and he doesn't have the correct last name correct we have to ask for what we want though yeah that's what women have to learn you know you need to do the research mm -hmm. and ask for what you want mm -hmm. and most of the time you can get it if you do we have well, to be strong your, your grandmother had a great great quote in the documentary mm -hmm. success came because i never saw obstacles yeah her oblivion was you know bliss really i mean she and people were like she wasn't oblivious she was smart i'm like i didn't say she was stupid i just said she was oblivious to yeah. so much which was a blessing at the time i mean we joke that if someone spit on her, she would think it's raining. And like, <laughs> she just was, you know, kind of how you're saying, just like, just ask for what you want. And I think that that's true. And if you are a woman who's constantly faced with adversity, like that wears on you. And I think Frida didn't know any different. So she just went for it. And mm -hmm. because she was naturally oblivious, like if she was faced with something, she just let it roll off her back which right. is also a blessing but then she also like wasn't very emotional and yeah. wasn't very um motherly and which she would talk about if she were here <laughs> you know this yeah. isn't a secret about frida and so that i think led to her not being you know this like more thick, more thin skin yeah just, she was yeah. thicker skin Unlike i think women purple sweet potatoes <laughs> exactly <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, that's no she was thick skin <laughs> but um i think that generation mm -hmm. you know they don't grow women like that anymore no and i think you know there's the they had the woman's or sorry the uh first session the first session yesterday around mm -hmm. generations and you know my generation really connecting with our kids 
and baby boomers connecting with their children because they couldn't talk to their parents about anything and they didn't have that kind of really close bond. And I see that in my family. So while my family worked together and had an amazing working relationship, still do, like we're a 60 year old company this year and like we're, we don't fight, we don't have some family drama, like very, very professional. But I see where my mom and my aunt couldn't lean on my grandma for certain things. So oh, they're different parents than they had, you know, to right. us, to me and my cousins and my sister. And so um, it is interesting to see how the generations change. But but back to your question, I think, you know, yes, being even in the industry for 10 years, I've really been able to see a change in women lifting up women and a lot of men lifting up women. There are like, you know, very supportive men in this industry too. Um, so that's been a big lesson. And I think something else I've learned or that has surprised me is at first, you know, I was always really anxious that like I only commanded respect because I'm Frida's granddaughter. And so I never lead with that. I never, I'm like, hi, I'm Alex from Frida's and Frida's granddaughter. Like I never say that. Yeah. And <laughs> I've had clients be like, were you ever gonna tell me you're like in the family? I was like, no, I wasn't, but now you know. Um, and I guess what surprised me in the last few years was because Frida's has, we have the 60 year legacy, our brand is the best selling brand in specialty produce according to IRI data, and we've refreshed our brand. Like we're still relevant after 60 years, and that comes with a lot of respect because produce isn't just about growing and shipping anymore. Like consumers need to know why produce is really good for them, and you need to market to consumers. And so there's a lot of companies in the industry who are great marketers, and there's some who just want to grow and let other people market, and we right. do that for a lot of growers. But with that, the, the respect for fantastic marketing has increased in this industry. And because Frida's for 60 years has never rested on our laurels around our, our brand, there's a lot of respect that comes with that. And so I have found that now if it does come up that I'm Frida's granddaughter, that people are like, oh, like, that's amazing. That's an amazing company. And you guys have grown. And like, if you've been there 11 years and your third generation, like you're a part of that growth, you're a part of keeping that brand relevant. So it's just, it, I guess like that's a recent change, but that really surprised me because I've been very self-conscious to make sure like I earn my respect. I work really hard and I've worked very hard for 10 years. And so to know that even just saying, like I introduced myself to an executive last night and he was, you know, I mean, everyone's been going up to him and he was very nice to me, very, very friendly guy, but like I was stumbling over my words. I'm never like that. I was like so really nervous to meet him. And then later, you know, afterwards, someone's like, this is Frida's granddaughter. He's like, you're Frida's granddaughter? I was like, yeah, I'm Karen's daughter, Frida's granddaughter. He's like, oh my God, I didn't know that. And so then like 10 minutes later, I was leaving. I was like, you know, great to see you. And he came and gave me a hug. And, and I think like, I just could tell he was like, wow, like, Right. It takes a lot of work to be in a family business, especially one that's been around this long and with powerful women and like the respect came. And so that was really surprising for me the last few years. And I'm really grateful for that. But we, we are our target audience is consumers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's very few produce brands that consumers could, can recall. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but Frida's is definitely one of them. I talk to my friends who are not in the business, and mm -hmm. I say, "Oh yeah, Frida's. I know that. Yeah, That's it's awesome. great stuff." And I think that goes to what you're saying here. We, we I wanted to lead. I, I hope you weren't uh, offended that we led with your great. No, not at all. I'm never offended in that way. But oh, I know no. that our listeners don't know her story. Mm -hmm. They know the brand, but I don't mm -hmm. think they know the story. So I wanted to start with that. But yeah. That's great, and you guys have done such a tremendous job in, in building that brand. And Thank it's, you. And it's, it's, it's hard in produce, yeah, because it it's is. not like a widget that, you know, there's mm -hmm. the consistency can be off, you know, but no fault of any one. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for people to build it, so congratulations. Thank you that. so much, appreciate that. And, she, like and she mentioned that she got a hug. The produce industry still hugs. Oh, we're huggers. <laughs> we do. Yeah, I mean, we are. Where we're recording this podcast, we are in Florida, so, yeah. you know, there's no rules here. So we are hugging. But it is nice. It is nice to kind of be back. And yeah. it is a family. I think that's another surprising thing was, like, when you kind of, you find the right people and you peel back all the layers of business and competition. And I think COVID kind of took away a lot of that edge of people in the industry we're all in this together. We're all trying to increase consumption, and I think we can do a better job of 
you know, the consumers listening to your show to like get them to just want to eat more produce. And so, right. um, so yeah, this industry is full of family and it's really, really refreshing. Yeah. There's a lot that's of family what, businesses. And, mm-hmm. But that's what somebody had also said to us that, uh, all the gr- the growers and the shippers, mm-hmm. we are one industry. So to take that synergy and move it forward and get consumption up is, you know, she viewed it more like the, anything not fruit and vegetable would be the real competition. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that was Teresa's vision for Produce Buds. We started the website a few years ago. We just started the podcast in, in the end of last year. And her vision was, uh, I want to. I want people to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. to help solve this health crisis. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And we want them to know how to prepare. Mm-hmm. And because you walk into the store, you see something you don't know, and you think, "Well, I'd buy that, but it will probably just lay there because I don't know what to do with it." Mm-hmm. We want them to learn. So. Yeah, and that's why Frida's. You know, my goal as director of sales, I want Frida's available in every supermarket across the country because our brand will help you understand what it is. Why is this good for me? What can I do with it in multiple ways? Like, you know, turmeric, fresh turmeric, we all know it's great for inflammation and has so many natural health properties, but what am I gonna do with all this fresh turmeric? And there are ways you can use it multiple times a day. Same with dragon fruit, purple sweet potatoes, shishito peppers. And so we're, we're not just trying to push product just to make sales. We're really trying to get consumers to have healthy new food experiences and want to share that with the people they love and make their life better through food. And it, you know, we, we were talking, we did some research around after or through COVID, a lot of people have veggie fatigue. They're looking for new vegetables. I mean, I knew I got got sick of broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, you know, and so, you know, shishito peppers are a great side dish. And yeah, and you can like, you can put like lemon and salt or you can put Parmesan cheese on it or soy sauce or herbs and garlic. And so- What's the Scoville level on that? I don't know the answer to that question. What's equal to? However- well, one in ten are hot, so I'm sure the hot one is maybe equal to like, I don't know, less than a jalapeno. Oh, okay, okay. But the mild ones are like, you know, a bell, like a zingy bell pepper. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, some people say one in seven is hot, but um, no, I don't want yeah. to end up with some Scotch bonnet. Oh like, no, 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 no. The hotter the better for me. But I first had those in a sushi restaurant. Oh yeah, exactly. Bonito flakes. That yeah, was fantastic. Exactly. I'd like to ask you uh, how many, mm-hmm. approximately how many items do you handle? So we now only and. For those listening, this might still sound a lot like a lot, but we sell 100 products. Uh, we at one point probably sold six to 800. Um, March 2020, we sold 450, and now we're down to 100. And so we've really focused on what are the items that consumers are going to buy. What do they want to see every day in their grocery stores? Because they want to know that there's variety or they want to try something new but not have to really search for it and you know to give everyone that experience of something new without feeling like it's some exclusive thing you have to be a part of and so um, we're really focused on fresh produce I think that's what makes Frida's unique right. in our categories we're really focused on fresh we maybe sell 17 non-fresh items so that means items that complement produce but that aren't fresh and super perishable but they're made from your other your products right so um We were the first company to sell non-fresh, to offer non-fresh produce items for the produce department. So Mm. egg roll wrappers, tofu, fresh crepes, soy chorizo, we call it soy riso, polenta. Um, So we sell, you know, dried chilies, dried mushrooms. So we sell these items that aren't fresh produce, but but that you prepare with fresh produce. And um, so we sell 17 of those. And... Yeah, so we're we're at a hundred. When you said uh, looking for new ideas, I'll be in the grocery store, and the person next to me, I'm like, "What are you cooking for dinner tonight? I need some inspiration." Yeah. So, again, like broccoli, mm-hmm. cauliflower. So always looking for something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. What is your number one selling item? Our number one selling item is dragon fruit, hmm. followed by ginger, our Stokes purple sweet potatoes, um, shallots. Mm. Shallots, if you want to be proper. Are they shallots or shallots? They're shallots, and I have had a lot. I have had produce. The people who work at the corporate office of grocery stores say, 
do not tell me to say shallots. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> so depending on the audience, I say shallots, shallots. But we had one of our growers come in a few years ago, and she just was like, shallots, shallots, shallots. I was like, okay, fine, it's shallots. <laughs> Same with endive and endive. So we right. sell Belgian endive lettuce, which is the cone-shaped, very fancy lettuce. And then there's endive lettuce, which is the curly lettuce that you can find more on like the East Coast. Okay. Um, and so, you know. It's funny because I worked on Hunts Point for A&J mm. Produce. And those guys were like, yeah, I, I need the shallots. Yeah. And so I would say shallots. And then people go, but it's shallots. I'm like, yeah. Oh, well, and then I figured, oh, yeah, of course. Like in New York, they would, you know, emphasize the wrong uh, <laughs> syllable. But exactly. they were right. Yeah, right. When we had our produce market in Charlotte, uh, a chef, a French chef came into the market. And he was looking at the onions and he said, do you have shallots? <laughs> and I said, I did, I'm not sure what that is. We don't have that, sir. So you mean shallots? <laughs> Can you spell that for me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, um, yeah, so what's new in the product line? Anything new coming up, exciting? So right now what we're focused on is really just bringing the best variety of, um, you know, items we currently sell. So right now we ha or, you know, innovation around items we sell. So really just trying to bring in great tasting dragon fruit from all over the world. Yeah. Dragon fruit is in over 85% of grocery stores in the country. So we're just trying That's to amazing. get that to 100. Yeah, and so... Um, really working to find the best varieties that give consumers, you know, a great eating experience. Uh, with shishito peppers, you know, we have innovation coming out around that um, with some seasoning kits. So that way, you know, when a consumer buys this bag of shishitos, they can go home and cook them up in the pan and then already have some seasoning in the bag to season it with. So two different that's flavors really there. Idea. Yeah. And then, um, that's really what we have right now. You know, citrus, we have new varieties of citrus that we're focusing on. Um, we just finished That are up. ready for market now? Yeah, so uh, we just finished up one of our pomelo varieties, the Tahitian pomelo. So um, it's not a regular old pomelo. It's, you know, a more yellow pomelo, seedier, but really, really sweet. And oh. so that's really what we're focused on. You know, if you go to the grocery store, there's a lot of products in the produce department. Yeah. And we've even reduced some and there's still a lot like we don't sell as many products and there's still a lot of products and do, do you have children i do i have a son he's 14 months old oh wow congratulations yes. thank you so i wonder do you do the cooking in your home i do and has he already been introduced to veggies so he yes he likes purple sweet potatoes i mean he's 14 months so he's like rejecting now he and throwing food because that's cool. <laughs> I was just listening. I'm in like this parenting community online, and she was like, "If your kid is throwing food, don't take it personally. Like they just think <laughs> Look throwing at this is trick. cool. Look at this yeah, trick I can like, make mom do. I can make her yeah. pick something up. They're like, I, gravity is amazing. And so he likes purple sweet potatoes. I gave him a Tahitian pomelo. Um, he likes broccoli, which is thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've introduced him to to lots of veggies. The Tahitian pomelo, how mm -hmm. big is it? Um, so I, mm, well, you can't see me. So <laughs> I would say it's the size of a. I mean, they range. You can go from a soft ball to maybe the size of a regular pomelo. A four count, that doesn't mean anything to these <laughs> listeners. A, you're the size of your head. So you can get the size of your head to the size of a softball. I think what we typically see is, you know, like a kid's basketball toy, you know, where like it fits in their hand, but it's still big enough. So and this what, one is typically smaller than normal. Yeah, models. typically smaller, a little bit more cone shaped. Yeah. And what do you, how do you prepare that? Oh, you have to eat it over a sink because it's so juicy. I'm not kidding. When what's the bricks level on that? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head, but when it's I sweet like what? Sweet like, I mean, it tastes like grapefruit. It tastes like a pomelo just without the bitterness. Mm -hmm. So it tastes like a really sweet. It's like grapefruit with honey in it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, will you be sampling that at the show? No, we are not <laughs> sampling at the show because you know we're based COVID. in California and COVID <laughs> still exists there. Um, no, they they have you know you can sample product at trade shows now, but there's like rules and regulations, and it's just not worth it. And mm -hmm. you know we don't have something new really, right? So it's like we're when we're putting ourselves out there, it's to drive awareness around Frida's, just like being on this podcast. It's to tell these consumers like, look, there's this really cool brand that 
is here to inspire you. That's what all we want. We yeah. just want to inspire you to try something new so that you keep coming back to the produce department looking for Frida's and looking for new produce. Right. Now, if cu customers go to your website, mm -hmm. they can find all these items with preparations and things mm -hmm. like that? Yep, we have tons of recipes that are really gorgeous. Our Instagram, which is Frida's Produce, F-R-I-E-D-A-S. Mm -hmm. um, Website, Instagram, we have YouTube videos, and on our website we have a store locator, so certain products, some of our top sellers, you can look to see if they have them nearby. So yeah, our website is super sell informative. you direct to any consumers? We sell our Stokes Purple Sweet Potatoes online uh, in 15 pound boxes, direct to consumers, okay. but that's the only product. Yeah, and we that's really Frida's.com? Frida's.com. F-R-I? E D A people. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I before E. Yes. Except after C. Yeah. <laughs> and there is no C. There is no C. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's great. Let's tell our consumers a little bit about your grandmother. Yeah. So. Uh, I, yeah, but no. Go, what go were you going to well, say? I, I, I'm just fascinated by this story, an award she got and handed back. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so, and I think this is relevant to <laughs> the somewhat beginning of our conversation. Right. So, as you all have heard, my grandmother was really the first woman in the produce industry who wasn't like a secretary or accountant or when, what have you. When did you. she start? Was it? She started, she had had my mom and my aunt, so the late 50s, she okay. started working in produce. Right. Um, she, I'll tell this story about the award first and okay, then kind yeah, of get into do. her yeah. story. So, she had started her company, Produce Specialties Inc. at the time, that's what it was called, and um, there's this paper called The Packer. It's a it's produce a industry job. newspaper, and they do still do, but they've changed the name, thanks to Frida, uh, you know, The Packer Man of the Year. And it's, you know, Produce Man of the Year. And it's, you know, so maybe someone who's done great marketing or great distribution or whatever, and they'd like to recognize them. <laughs> and so, when Frida would go to shows or conferences, it was like, welcome, gentlemen, and Frida. She was literally the only woman in the room. And, you know, she awesome. took that. Yeah, like she had a great sense of humor mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff. And so she got awarded the Packer Produce Man of the Year, you know, the plaque and everything. And she goes up to accept it and she hands it back. She's like, needs to say Produce Woman of the Year, Produce Person of the Year. <laughs> and they were like, oh, crap. I didn't really think about that. And so, and so what year was that? I have no clue. <laughs> Probably the 60s or 70s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, seven, it could have been as late as the 70s. It could have been in the 70s. Yeah. So she founded. So so I'll, she was the first feminist to go on, like put a W O in front exactly, of that. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so she, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about her story. And there is a documentary out there called Fear No Fruit. You can watch it <laughs> online for free. Um, if you go on Frida's.com, you'll see in the bottom right, it says, watch Fear No Fruit documentary. It's an hour and a half. It's really special. It uh, features yours truly. Yep. The director said I am the comedic release uh. in that film. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I lived with my grandma at the time of filming. And so um, it's really special. So... But my grandma got started in uh, the late 50s working for Jamara on the LA Wholesale Produce Market, a produce company. Yeah. She just needed a job with odd hours so she could breastfeed my mom. But she talked to her aunt and uncle who worked for Jamara at the time and they told her, you know, it's a 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. business. So it was perfect for what she was looking for. And they're like, look, our accountant just quit. Come work for us. She was very bad at math, but they didn't care. And so she <laughs> went and worked for them. And one day they went on vacation and she had to work the sales floor. And they sold mushrooms at the time, which is very exotic back then. And she was like, I don't know anything about sales, but she was fearless, like we've talked about. So she worked on the sales floor for a week and she sold an ad into a retailer for Thanksgiving on mushrooms. And they needed a lot of mushrooms and she did not have any more mushrooms. She didn't know what to do, so she called all these mushroom people around California and they're like, it's Thanksgiving, like we're sold out. She's like, I will come up there and pack these mushrooms myself because this retailer is putting them in their ad. So she did that and they were like, this woman's crazy, so here are your mushrooms. And so when her aunt and uncle got back, they're like, you're fantastic at sales. You're not leaving the sales floor. So she was the first woman to really be on the sales floor. And she was doing so well when the um, wholesale produce market had a stand open up, the owners of the market came to her and said, we really think you should go into business for yourself. And she had never, she had no idea how to do that. They're like, this well, is the LA produce This is the market, LA right? produce market, mm -hmm. yeah. So she, uh, which, by the way, there's they now have a food festival, if you will, every Sunday called Smorgasbord, 
in LA on the original wholesale produce market and I went a few weeks ago and I didn't realize I was going to the produce market until I got there and I walk in I'm like this is the produce market and I text my mom I'm like what was grandma's address what stand were we and in front of the stand was like you know tacos or something it was like I'm like can I get back they wouldn't let me back there I was like ugh. but anyways I ate tacos where my grandma sold produce so anyways Mm -hmm. um So she went into business for herself selling brown mushrooms and fast forward a few years, you know, she was the only woman on the market, on the, you know, on the street, if you will. And this produce broker uh, was going down the market saying, I have these Chinese gooseberries from New Zealand. (laughs) And everyone's like, I don't know what the heck that is, but go to Frida, she'll talk to anyone. (laughs) And she's like, you know, what's so crazy is a few months ago, I had a retailer come to me, a grocery store come to me and say they had a shopper go into the store and go to their produce manager and say, hey, I just went on a mission to New Zealand. I found Chinese gooseberries and I'd like to see them in my store here. Um, They're like, I don't know what a Chinese gooseberry is, but I will go to my boss and I will find out. And so they went to Frida. She was, you know, willing to do anything. She said, I don't have Chinese gooseberries, but when I find them, I will call you. So when this broker came and said, I have Chinese gooseberries, she's like, I have a customer. I'll take them. (laughs) So she takes a pallet, which for those of you that don't know, it's, you know, a wooden crate essentially um, that has, you know, cases and cases of produce so she took a pallet of the chinese gooseberries and it took four months to sell so that's how we knew they had a great shelf life and she got a reorder so she was selling chinese gooseberries for a while and her and some other people in california were like look the name chinese gooseberries like doesn't mean anything to anyone so we should really rename it and because it's brown and fuzzy uh, maybe we should call it the kiwi just like the kiwi bird in new zealand and so my grandma is credited with introducing the kiwi fruit to america and naming it kiwi right. and so ever since then our company has introduced over 200 products so my grandmother introduced red seedless watermelon habanero chilies wow. jicama shallots <laughs> sugar snap peas purple artichokes um many many black garlic spaghetti squash spaghetti squash and she named it spaghetti squash sun chokes and she named them sun chokes yeah. um so yeah, so that's my grandma's story and you know, she passed away 2 years ago, but she would tell you that, you know, yeah, she started the business, but my mom and my aunt really built the business and where we are today is because of them and you know, I don't think my mom is Karen and my aunt is Jackie and I don't think Karen and Jackie, I never hear them say that, but my grandma really started saying that towards the end of her life. She was getting all this credit, especially from the documentary, and she deserves it for sure. But to her, she's like, yeah, I started it, but they really took it to be what we are today, and we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Karen and Jackie. So um, that always warms my heart that she always really recognized that and never tried to take credit. But again, I think it goes back to that generation that she she knew her, her flavor. She didn't mm-hmm. need to go, ah, me, 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 me. Yeah. And it's just very easy to go, yeah. You know, and I've spent a lot of time with your mom at conventions and places like that. We've been to training seminars together and things like that. She's a great lady. Mm-hmm. She's so smart. Thank um, you. We're, I agree. We're really fortunate yeah. to have had her in the industry mm-hmm. as a friend. Yeah. So. And we can see the apple's not going to fall too far. Or is we, should we say the Chinese yeah, gooseberry the Chinese, kiwi exactly. fruit is not going to fall too far exactly. from the vine? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Vine. That's very appropriate. Well, we would talk to you all day. I would talk to I you know guys you all day. you probably got to move on and do what some other things. Story. Yeah. yeah. I, I really appreciate so your time. Yeah. And I hope this. everyone listening learn something new today and maybe is inspired to try something new that they've never had before right we used to say eat one fruit a day that scares you so (laughs) go to the that's i love the title of that documentary fear Fear no fruit fruit. your your grandmother and your mother and aunt and now you are not very good so the next time that we're in california we can come by for a tour (laughs) yeah come for a tour we'll do a episode you know two with yeah. Frida's yeah, yeah. maybe Karen will, Karen and Jackie might be there you yeah. know, get them on so um, so yeah we I appreciate your time Frida's.com F-R-I-E-D-A-S dot com check it out look for those Stokes purple sweet potatoes and all the other products around it you guys have some great recipes with those yes, too. yes yes awesome. delicious recipes thank you so much Alex thank we you we wish you all the success Thank you uh, so much. Trade show here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, listeners, for joining us again today. 
We hope you were inspired by Alex to fear no fruit and to try one fruit or veggie every day that scares you. Please take a second before you leave to subscribe and or follow our podcast on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. We are on over 10 different podcast feeds, including YouTube. And if you want to help support this podcast by making a donation, we would be so grateful. Just go to anchor.fm forward slash produce hyphen buzz, and you will see a support button below the podcast description. Click on it. Give what you can. No amount is too small. And of course, no amount is too large. Thank you, listeners, and good night. Well, thank you listeners for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast, brought to you by Produce Buzz, the gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time, and please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page, and check out our website at www.producebuzz.com There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies how to select, store, and prepare them as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us Until next time be fruitful and don't forget to veg out